Welcome, everybody, back to uh, Siegel Talks uh, here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY of the City University um, of New York uh, in Manhattan, in New York. And uh, my name is Frank Henschka, and I'm a director of the Central. And since 10 weeks, we are hosting talks, talking to uh, artists, colleagues from around the world, from around the globe. Uh, to see how they experience the time of Corona, uh, what it means for us, uh, how they create meaning, well, thoughts about theater and performance, that is our field. And, um, and uh, we live in uh, times that are almost unimaginable. It's a reality uh, outside, uh, seems to be stranger than fiction. Uh, and there are uncertainties inside. And uh, now things since last week turned, especially in the United States, uh, the atmosphere um, is different. Priorities have changed, and the murder of George Floyd uh, was the match. You know, the, the the gasoline that was out there was the COVID uh, virus, uh, the confinement, it was the exceptional high unemployment, almost a quarter, if not more, people out of work, and uh, it's uh, shocking. And uh, I would like to share a statement uh, from the public theater. It's very much also our own. And uh, Oscar Eustace also was here on the show. And I would like to say that uh, the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and uh, Breonna Taylor have demonstrated in horrific fashion that racism upon which our country was built. We mourn the loss of these black women and men, and we are grieved and outraged by their death. Theater is for, by, and of the people, yet it has taken us far too long to proclaim the simple truth, Black Lives Matters. We must stand in solidarity with Black artists, Black staff members, and the Black community, and actually all communities of color. We must do more, much more to fight the racism that infects every institution in the country, and us at City University included. We must recognize that this is a time of change, that we have to be part of the change we want to see and we need to live up to our own ideals. As a note, I've always already said it yesterday, but we got an Instagram from a New York actor, Ilan Baraha, who said, uh, after he got our Siegel Talk announcement, who cares about this right now? People are dying, be part of the conversation about justice. And uh, Ilan, of course, is uh, right, and it's true, but it's also wrong. I think we do need to care what is happening in the world. Um, we have listened to our friends and colleagues, artists from Hong Kong, a very complicated situation. Just last week, we talked to them. Haiti, Brazil, Lebanon, South Africa, Egypt, the shooting of demonstrators uh, in Chile uh, just last uh, December, the police beatings of innocent people in Romania. And their struggle is also our struggle, especially also for the artists, but for everyone. And I think America should turn away from isolation, from nationalism, and it is part of the problem we are experiencing. It is not right to think that what happens here counts more, um, actually, because we do listen to our colleagues everywhere in Brazil and Egypt and uh, Hungary. We have reasons to be even more outraged at the murder of George Floyd. There is universal injustice. America is no exception. And America really, really should be an exception. For centuries, the black community has suffered much more than others in these countries, and it's happening now again. Not only coronavirus kills, so does the racial politics in the US. Social and economic inequities, poor access to healthcare, discrimination in healthcare settings, greater reliance on public transportation and much high, higher numbers in healthcare and in the service industries, and differences in employment, they are all factors leading to the much much greater burden of the black community and all people of color in this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Our president refuses to wear a mask like everybody else. He suggests we should inject ourselves with disinfectant. He is hiding in a White House in a bunker when it seems to get dangerous. And he suggests that the US military here to protect us as he is here to protect us. He says US military should shoot at American people, protesters who want to see change. And he's holding up a Bible after the police clears a way for him to get to a church. It's uh, unacceptable. This needs to change. It has to change. And it will change. 
And we all, as in the field of theater performance, we have to look hard what role theater and the arts can play and should play in the real way, the symbolic way, the imaginary. And we need to see how artists in other countries who for decades have dealing with civil uprising, authoritarian regimes, censorship and police killings in Egypt, Lebanon, Chile, Cuba, Brazil. It is important to find out what we can learn from South Africa, from artists like Basil Jones and the theater he created with others in the years of apartheid and that, how that contributed uh, to a change. And of course, we do have a responsibility here and we will have uh, talks now with uh, planning with Nigel Smith and James Strax, uh, Woody King Jr., Tamila Woodard and many, many others uh, coming up um, to also look a little bit more closer at New York City. Normally it's one day out of the five, but we will of course react to this. Um, also a significant uh, French philosopher, Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, will join us next week and talk about the significance and meaning of art. We are also looking forward to that. So um, as I said, we have to know what role art is playing, has been playing, what is right, what is wrong, what has been missing for a long time, and how is the struggle for our communities of color, the communities who are not at the very, very center on the light uh, of the Broadway theaters, or sometimes also of the experimental or downtown theater with us, is a great worker in the field, in the vineyard of theater um, and performance, someone who over decades has made a great, great contribution with the Mayi Theater Company, he has uh, supported uh, uh, the Asian American Theater Company, produced plays, work plays, created plays, also directed. Actually, I just learned, has also been an early, early supporter of Hal Round. It's the first time that he's on himself. Um, Ralph Pena is with us. So Ralph, thank Hello. you for coming. And I apologize that it's a longer statement uh, in the very beginning. No, I think it's important to, to say. And, and, you know, I, you, you're sort of asking what, theater has to to do with with what's currently happening and i come from a background of protest theater during the marcos regime in the philippines and i've experienced these kinds of upheavals in my life a few times um and every time there, this existential question comes up like what is the role of theater in protests right or in civic action and inciting inciting um, community engagement. And every time I go back to my experience in the Philippines of actually talking to communities and working within communities and getting the inspiration for creating the work from the communities. Tell us um, a bit about that time. What, what happened? What did you do? Well, we put up a, we put up what a- What year was it? This was 1982. Um, uh, we put up a, a street theater company that, you'd, that used vaudeville as a form for political protest. And we used um, headlines of the day to create a short plays that we could put up in the middle of the street in five minutes. They're called lightning plays. And then disperse so we would get arrested by the police. Um, and that went on for several years until, you know, at one rally, I believe, for then... Um, Corazon Aquino, who was not, who was just beginning to, on her political journey, and Marcos was still um, president. We actually performed to a crowd of uh, approaching one million people at the national park. I've never, of course, <laughs> I've never experienced that before. Um, How did that happen? A million people. Tell us a bit about the. Setup. Um, they, they, the, the, the uh, uh, Aquino, Benigno Aquino, was just shot. Uh, and assassinated in 1983, I and believe. He was a community leader? Uh, no, he was the opposite. Or? He was the opposition to Marcos. The um, opposition to Marcos. Mm -hmm. Right. And he, had, he was in the United States in exile, but he decided to come home. And on the plane home, he was met by soldiers and then shot on the tarmac of the Manila airport. And that, that created a huge national outcrying, much like what we're seeing now, of the people saying, I've had enough. You can't do this. And so that propelled um, his widow into a political run for president. And Marcos, who, has, who had already been in power for um, more than a decade under martial law or with imposing martial law, was ousted 
literally booted out of the palace. And that's when we found out Imelda and her shoes and jewelries and all that. But it was people power, they called it, that actually changed the system. And I saw firsthand how theater and the culture sector was a participant in building that uh, momentum. And, and so when I, whenever I am uh, run up against these kinds of events in history, I always go back to that. Like, how do we, how do we participate in voicing the people's um, demands, right? What are they asking for? What are we all asking for? And, and participate that way. So it doesn't, it feels a lot more organic and also it's an, it's, it's, it's action. And it, it, you know, as opposed to, you know, the traditional expository exposition of, of, I think Western theater, this is, we go to the streets and we do it. Um, and that has served me well, uh, I think over the years and in, in running my theater company, the question is always, um, why do we make theater? For whom we make theater? And what kind of theater do we make? So knowing those three things sort of under, you know, always guides how we program. And now here we are again at another crossroads. And to, to me, this feels very much like the first time we founded Mayi in 1989. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, we didn't really have any mentors. We just thought, oh, let's put up a theater company because how difficult can that be? And now 30 years later, um, we're still challenged by many things, but um, that's, that's, I always go back to that experience in the Philippines. So, so tell us a bit, you had short so, lightning plays, four or five minutes, you improvised the scene and then you left, went to another part. And no, we just dispersed, we dispersed. Oh, excuse me, one second, excuse yes. me. Yes, I think uh, Ralph did say he would get a delivery he has been waiting for uh, uh, for a long time and he had to take it. So um, as you see, this um, truly um, um, is, a, is a, a, a live show. And I think uh, his experience reminds us, like many artists who talked about these times. Sorry about that, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, of course, that these times of, uh, uh, of, of complication, of crisis, of anger, of protests, um, that these are also times of change, and there is something in here uh, um, that uh, um, perhaps will also help us to learn to get to a better place. So, um, yeah. So those lightning, those lightning rallies. Um, one uh, an example of this was we decided to hold a rally the, at the very start of the Miss International Beauty Pageant that Imelda was hosting. And so we had our costumes underneath our street clothes. And, oh my. Yes. See, this is what COVID does to us. You know, we, uh, we also have to wait for days uh, for, for, for one moment, uh, for one delivery. And, uh, and, um, and uh, you cannot miss it, not even for a how long interview. And it is, um, of importance and it also shows that what we talk about here is connected to life our daily life the way we live and it's not separate which yes. normally we all pretend it is and it is not no and i don't I have it. a i don't have a doorman so yeah i had to do that um but yeah so we had you know the miss international pageant that imelda hosted we had our costume which um was drag actually underneath our regular clothes. And then just before the beginning of the, it's, it was being telecast live around the world. We went in front of the venue and took out our costumes and we played Miss Imperialism, Miss Fascism, Miss Bureaucrat Capitalism, all that stuff. And we held um, a mini beauty contest uh, in front of that event. And immediately we were surrounded by a phalanx of armed security and luckily the international press was there and they all came out of the venue and trained their cameras on us so the military couldn't touch us uh, and we sort of went outside this complex to get out into the main street and then ran into a mall and dispersed so nobody could track us but th those were the kinds of tactics that we used 
to make art when we were not allowed to, to make it. So theater always finds a way, I guess, to express mm -hmm. itself. And I find that it is most creative when it's faced with adversity. And, um, and that's, I think, what, what we're experiencing right now. So to me, it feels like, this moment feels like when I first started theater. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I had to do something. And so in the last couple of months, that's what we've been trying to figure out. What are we going to do in the next few months if, say, uh, we're not able to get back inside the theater for a year, a year and a half, two years. What's going to happen? And I'm How's not- How's Maie doing? Yeah, how's Maie theater doing? Uh, we're struggling, well, we're struggling like everyone else. But as you know, New York theater is stratified. We're not all working in the same um, uh, stratosphere or whatever, these hierarchies, it's, it's hierarchical. So, the responses are all different from the big theater companies to the small theater companies. They're all trying to figure out what we're going to do in the near term and in the long term. Um, what's consistent in among everyone is that we're all sort of groping in the dark. We don't know um, what, what this new form might take. Uh, it, some people are doing digital, are thinking of digital, and some people are thinking a hybrid of live performance and digital. Some people are thinking scaling down to parking lots, to parks for four people, three people, 10 people. Um, and some people are thinking um, uh, giving people headsets and observing a play from across the street or uh, drive-in uh, uh, movie houses of having cars surround a form a circle and surround a performer in the middle. Everybody is trying to figure out ways and, and including, including um, reducing theater occupancy by 70%, up to 70% and only allowing 30% of, of their normal capacity inside the theater. But every, all of these things, we are challenges, you know, how do you have a, a, a production played to 30% capacity and have it make it econ make economic sense for, for the theater. So right now we are being called upon to be as creative as possible. And there isn't really any national guidance on what we're supposed to be doing. Um, or There's what- There's no we, ministry of culture, of course. In no, we don't. And we're not subsidized. So the, the example that I gave you of the 70% seats being pulled out is the Berlin, Berliner Ensemble, right? And they have, uh, what, a 600 seat theater? Mm -hmm. And now they're only going to allow 30% in. Not, everybody, not every theater in the world can do that. Um, especially here uh, in the United States where uh, the government has basically abdicated its role in, in supporting the art, art institutions, you're left to your own devices. Even the big houses are trying to figure that out. Now, if you come down to our level, there's basically not very much support. And we've been told by some people uh, in higher offices that we should look for rich donors. Um, to, if you haven't, yeah. <laughs> you know. To subsidize... Forced. Right, to subsidize the gap between um, what we need to, the cost of producing a, a production and then the shortfall in ticket sales. So, uh, if the, and we don't have national guidance from, from the DOH or from, or from any uh, sort of health institutions to what do we need to do for um, safety, not just for our audiences, but for our actors and crew. Uh, on stage, how are they going? How are they supposed to practice social distancing? Does that mean we're only doing one-person shows, or shows where they don't touch? Um, how does that work? It doesn't. Yeah, those are those are real questions that we're sort of all asking, um, but we are all left to our own devices, basically. Yeah, you know, and just to, to to give to our listeners also a bit of context of New York City. There uh, was an announcement, I think, yesterday, the Metropolitan Opera, one of the great operas in the world, hasn't been able to pay their staff, their artists, since March. They will not perform till December. It might be a fundraiser on New Year's Eve. They don't even know afterwards. 
The financial outlook is unclear. It had already been struggling for various reasons, but uh, it already had been. So there is the opera uh, is uh, no longer able at the moment to take care of itself. So for a Magi's theater company, which had to struggle in the even called the good times, and you know, I'm sure how hard you work, every New York company that fundraises, you know, how hard and how much time goes into that, you know. So we are worried uh, um, about you and you have done such a contribution to have the Asian American theater community visible in New York. How was your experience? How, how do you feel, do you fit in in the New York uh, theater community at large? Is it visible? Are people know it? Is it easy? Is it open arms? Is it more complicated? How has it been? Uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to be seen and, and, and heard. Um, and it's 30 years since we, we've started. Um, um, a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times came out with an article about the cancellation or shuttering of multiple Asian American plays, um, which in some ways was a flowering of Asian American theater. This included the Headlands at uh, Lincoln Center uh, LCT3, uh, the Endlings at New York Theater Workshop, Cambodian Rock Band at Signature Theater, Suicide Forest at Ma Yi, uh, Wolf Play at um, Soho Rep, and Young Jean Lee um, that was on Broadway. Um, those were all closed. And the New York Times named all the theaters in that article except for us. Yeah. And so to me- What's the reason? Why do you think? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> they said, they said, I think the excuse was, and this was from the editor, that they only named the venues and not the theaters. But I, uh, two of those plays canceled were produced by us. Two of the writers affected our like members Lewis. of our I writer's lab. Yeah. yeah. And when they say Wolf Play was produced by Soho Rep, but not us, and it was a co-production, it, it, to me, it's like what, I, it's erasure, right? So for me, 30 years later, really, I still have to ask you to do this. Um, and since you're talking about the flowering of Asian American theater, we started planting seeds 30 years ago. Um, and we have the largest writers group in the United States. So those kinds of things, we always come up against again and again. And at some point, you know, I also have my blow up moment. I'm going, you know, I'm, 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 ti I'm tired of this. I'm tired have of a having- a moment, you. tell us, yeah, tell us. Well, I wrote Please to the do. New York Times. What I did wrote you write? Well, I said, explain to me how this kind of erasure is possible. When you did an in-depth article on Asian American plays being canceled, but never mentioned my theater company and we were involved with four of the projects that you named. So how is that possible? And uh, they said, oh no, you should be, you should keep quiet. Basically, that's what I was told, you should keep quiet because we review your plays. And I'm saying, you review my plays has nothing to do with you, this article where you focused on the flowering of Asian American theater and the cancellation of these plays. You review my theater because you owe your, your audiences, right? A consumer guide about what they should and shouldn't see. And because the Asian American theater community or the Asian American community, which is 12% of New York subscribes to your paper. That's why you should review me. And uh, that all fell on deaf ears. They did, rev they did add our, our, our name to that article after the fact, but I wasn't making noise so you would add my name. The fact that you didn't see me to begin with is the issue. And it's not just me. It's every theater of color, every small theater company that has to beg the times to please, please, please review us. Uh, and the, the constant, constant, constant um, blind spots that we run up against with them. And I've, I've sort of had it. I also want to say, you know what, don't come. Um, yeah, so there's that. So to me, it's always been a struggle of proving legitimacy, of proving agency. Do we belong in the community? Um, and, and, and it was a long, long, long struggle to, to, to be seen. And then just very recently, we have this event 
Um, and this, this happens to theaters of color all over the country. And uh, it's, it's uh, very frustrating. It's not just us, it's not just us. So every theater of color struggles with this. Um, uh, a, a real question here is, uh, if you look at it, it's like what theater of color is able to export plays to larger venues? How many produ productions started at theaters of color make it to the regionals? You probably, um, you, you'd be challenged to sort of, um, to name those plays, right? Yeah. That, that, that is written by our writers of color, produced by a, a, a theater of color that moves. And, 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 and the, the, the um, reason given always is that theater of color, the Yoyo community is not a theater going community. So that refrain is still true today. Um, to which I say, you can't expect a community to come and support your work if you've never had a relationship with that community. You can't just suddenly decide, I'm going to do a black play and expect the black community to show up when you don't have a relationship with that black community. The same thing with Native Americans and Latinos and Asians. You, it's now fashionable for large theaters to program diversity into their seasons, right? But what you really wanna ask is, is that for show? What kind of relationship do you have with the community? What are, who, who, are, who, is, who is watching? How are you bringing these communities into the theater to experience this work with you? And nine times out of 10, um, it's, a, it's a diversity programming gimmick um, without, any without any effort to reach out to the community, they do it for two months before the show and then drop it. Um, and then that's that until they decide to do another one two years down the road. So those are, those are some of the things that we continue to struggle with. And, and I've already decided that I'm not gonna work with a theater company that doesn't have, uh, if it's a co-production, if you don't have sort of existing programs for engaging with the communities that you want to represent, then we can't work together because I don't want to be used as your diversity um, pony, you know? And that's, that's sort of been the, the uh, constant in, in our production history or in our 30 year history is that we're always having to say, hi guys, we're here. Um, it's, it's nonstop. Yeah. And uh, about this, this coronavirus thing, um, you know, we were all thinking about coronavirus, right? Uh, starting in March. Um, but last week that changed. Suddenly, it's not the coronavirus that we're thinking about today. It's the, um, the protests that are happening in the street because black people are getting shot around the country by police. Um, and that, that's a very real thing. <laughs> and now, apart from trying to figure out how we're gonna figure out uh, how we're gonna create, we have to try to understand like what we can do concretely to be, to participate in what's happening in the street and to support the communities that need our support. Um, so it's right now, it, like, it, it does feel like a, a, like a big upheaval of multiple, um, multiple events that we need to sort of be very nimble around. And, and once again, I always go back to like, oh, how did we do this? Like, what did we do um, to make sure we're connected to the people, right? That are, that are suffering the most and that we're representing that community, the interests of that community or my community, my Asian American theater community, how are we bringing them together to support other communities of color. It's all, you know, this, it's an unbroken thread of struggle, of civil rights struggles, equality struggles that go back many, 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 many years. And, and I, 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 that's what I want my community to sort of understand um, because racism runs across 
all communities, including mine. So that's the other thing that we have to do is educate even Asian Americans to try to understand um, what's going on and that it's not different from our experiences, that there are parallels to this and that they're, you know, to build empathy for each other. So it's not one community of color against another community of color, uh, which is already happening, right? Because one of the cops in Minneapolis is Asian. So the, they're taking those kinds of things and using it to divide communities of color even more. Uh, and we have to fight that. We have to fight all of those those kinds of uh, attempts to divide. And our president is really good at that, which is what's happening, why you have all of this upheaval out, out in the street, because he wants us to be uh, disorganized and put us uh, and in chaos, because then if, he, if we're in chaos, he wins. And that's, we're trying to fight that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the other thing that um, we're working on right now is uh, we're trying to, very early on in the process, we decided that our focus for the next few months is to employ our community of artists to find jobs for them. We, I am very er of the opinion that this is a long um, hiatus, that, this, that we're not gonna be able to really come together in a room until there's a vaccine. And hopefully there is one very soon, but um, looking at all the predict, you know, the, the steps that have to happen and the usual trajectory of, of vaccine development, it will take some time, not just to come up with the vaccine, but to put it, to manufacture it and distribute it widely and administer it widely enough so that people are safe. So potentially we're, we're not gonna be able to do theater in a room again, like we used to for a year and a half or two years. And in that time, what do we do with all the individual artists, the freelancers, the house managers, the technicians, the, the designers, the actors, the writers? How are they going to make a living? And it also matters because we want to keep them in New York. A lot of artists have already planned to leave the city. Um, you hear that, yeah. And- Who's and, leaving in your- What's that? The artists are leaving from your community? They are decided yes, to some, of, some of them are, some of them already left because they can't afford rents uh, with no work. And as you know, some of them never qualified for unemployment. Some did, but also that ends. So a lot of them moved back when they could to their parents' homes. And now I don't know that they can come back with no jobs, right? So one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do we keep our community intact and employed? So that's what we're leading with in the next few months is finding work for them. And what we've devised at least for us right now, is I've just convinced my board to support a transition from what we're doing right now into a digital format. So we're converting our rehearsal studio Midtown into a broadcast studio and also developing broadcast kits, kits that we can send to the actors wherever they are with light sound and whatever equipment, they cameras and all that stuff that they can put up a studio in their home and we can remotely uh, orchestrate all those remote sites into something like live theater. I don't know <laughs> how that's all gonna work. It's, we've never done it, um, but we're, we're moving in that direction to try to give people work. Um, the, our uh, technicians, our designers are now, now all working to convert our studio into a TV station. <laughs> and we're buying equipment and, and uh, training on this new program that isn't gonna be Zoom, because um, Zoom is very limited, but we're going to come up with something that we can, it's all, you know, it's almost like television, except it's going to be done live and we're allowing our audiences to interact with the actors live. 
Um, so we don't know how that's going to work, but we're trying to wrap our brains around how to keep the live aspect going, even if we're on this format, we're in the internet, but it's all because we want to keep people employed. Um, the creativity, I think, you know, will follow, but first we got to make sure people have money for rent and food. And that's what I'm working on. Um, I'm, I've been making appeals to foundations, to the government. You know, we got some um, PPP money to keep our staff. Our staff is employed. Um, my board has committed to keeping all the staff employed throughout this, however long it takes. And, and also gave me a little bit of money to try to make this conversion happen. Um, but that's what we're doing. Um, and I don't know if, it's, if it will succeed or how it's going to how it's going to develop over time, but we just want the tools to, to give to artists, especially individual artists and freelancers who are sort of left out of the conversation here is we're talking about theaters and institutions. How are they going to work? Um, and we want to be able to give them the, uh, uh, send them the tools like, okay, okay, here's that, or you can take, you know, go to the studio and create something and we'll record it. Um, so we're doing that. And we've already commissioned three new plays that are already uh, being developed uh, with this format in mind, because I don't think you can take an existing play and then cram it into this digital format. I think the playwrights and the artists have to create specifically for it. And so we have three new commissions that went out. Um, and they're all in various stages of development. Some of them are ready to go. Um, we're doing, I think we might be doing a, an entire puppet thing in Wisconsin because some of our artists are stuck in Wisconsin. And then we're, we're doing another play in Staten Island with uh, an entire family stuck at home. So we're, we're figuring out what to do and how to remain creative during, during all this time. And now, of course, with what's happening in the street, that's also something that's very front and center um, with, with what we're do, dealing with and how we're going to respond to that. So uh, last week we had a, I don't know if you know about Play Per View. They hold readings and then um, uh, contribute the proceeds to a nonprofit theater in the city. Um, and last week we had a reading, but we decided that it's probably better to give all that money to racial justice. Um, so we did that. And we're looking for those opportunities <laughs> to see how we can help more than just sort of uh, release statements um, on our website. Like what can we do to make it, to, to make a difference? And there's a lot going on. Oh, Frank, <laughs> a lot. I don't. Um, yeah, and then with all of this stuff, you know, one of the things that we're struggling with is: do we? Is this a theater or is it a movie? And whose jurisdiction does it fall under? Is it Actors' Equity or is it SAG-AFTRA? And so those questions are now. Uh, plaguing all the theaters. Like, what are we doing? If you go digital, what does that mean? Uh, who, which union has jurisdiction over that? And that's something that's, that everyone is trying to figure out. There are a lot of conversations going on uh, in boardrooms across the United States about how to do that with a lot of lawyers involved. So I don't know where that's all gonna end up, but I also know I can't wait for people in a room to decide what my season will be, right? Or if, mm -hmm. whether I can make art. That doesn't work with me. <laughs> like, you can't tell me what I can and can't do. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to, to still get people employed, work and make something as they're figuring out, uh, you know, who makes the money. That's basically who gets the, the benefits and the, the health and pension. But I can't wait for them to figure that out because it's June, right? And we only have a few more months before the fall starts. Are we not 
going to do anything. Um, so there's a lot uh, going on, I think. And I'm, it's not just for me, it's for all my colleagues as well, uh, off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. We're all trying to figure that out. And I think it's, it's different for people who don't own their theaters. We don't own a theater, right? We've always just rented. Um, and so I can't mm, make a decision on say, uh, to say, I'm only going to do 30% occupancy because I don't, that space isn't mine. So I have to work through all of those challenges and also figure out whether the landlords will cut us deals to lower the rents if we're only doing 30% occupancy. Um, yeah. There's a lot uh, of things to consider, a lot the the economics of making theater in the, in, in the city uh, are different, I think, than in many places around the world. I've been talking to colleagues in Asia and they're, they're also struggling with the same, they're also struggling with the same uh, challenges, especially when it comes to freelancers and independent artists, um, putting them to work. So, so I think what, what's especially useful for me is that I've been able to talk to these uh, artists around the world and try to figure out what they're doing to see if we can apply it here and then share what we're trying to do to see if they can use it there. But there's an opportunity here, I think, to break down walls that have traditionally existed between our theaters um, because of physical distance. That's gone. I can work with any artist now around the world um, without having to worry about, you know, can we bring them over here? Um, so th that's an opportunity, uh, I think, that needs to be explored. Um, I, you know, we have all these new graduates, for example, right, who are leaving schools with their MFAs. Um, I spoke to some graduating classes, and they're all worried about what they're going to do after school and whether there's employment waiting for them. And all of them uh, have really, they're scared as I am scared, but I, I, I talked to some of them and, and, and I said to look at this again as an opportunity to bring new ideas to the table, right? Theater doesn't have to be what it was before. There are ways it might be able to change and you're the, you're the catalyst for that change. It's your ideas, you know, we, it's yours to, for the taking. And every theater company in the United States and in the world are looking for these kinds of solutions for ideas, because we're all in the same boat. So if, you, if you're a new graduate and you have an idea, take it to a theater company, pitch it to the, to the, the people there and see, you know, if, if, if they might be interested. And I, I'm sure they will be because we don't know what we're doing. And we're looking for these kinds of ideas and, you know, all these young kids will have, will have them. I, I spoke to a Chinese artist who just got her MFA and she's uh, developing VR, uh, a virtual reality theater. So she designs all the sets, the entire environment, and you watch it through your goggles, but there's a play inside um, and you're actually in the play. So that's new. <laughs> And maybe, you know, I, I encourage her to, to, to keep going. And I'm interested in also exploring that with us. Um, and um, we're working with also with uh, some people in Korea to try to, to um, um, tell a story about um, digital, the, the history of digital use in Korea and how, how we might be able to put that into a play. And, um, and the other thing, too, is that we're, you know, with this new reality, we're able to work with the disabled community in ways that we have not been before. Because, again, they don't, you know, uh, physical limitation is less of a factor now that we're all at home. So we're developing a, a play with, with deaf actors. Um, so we're, you know, it's all visual and words are not... Um, don't, are not at the forefront of this, are not the important aspect of the play. We're developing that now. And so new things for us, things that we've never tried before, that's sort of 
that's come our way and I'm, I'm interested in doing it. Like I told you, it's like, it feels like the beginning for me because I don't know what I'm doing. And there seems like there's an opportunity here to do something that we've never done before. And that's sort of exciting, um, scary, exciting, daunting. Uh, but that's sort of in my DNA. And that's what I, that's what I, re I respond to it <laughs> in ways, you know, that I had not been uh, in touch with for many, many years. And so I know my hair is white, but, um, but I, yes, I'm in touch with that early part of me of like, there's something to do here that I don't know what it is, but I'm willing to sort of go down the road and see where it leads. Wow, that is uh, that is that is a uh, uh, truly inspiring. Of course, also all worrisome. Uh, what what you have to carry on your shoulders, next to I'm sure other things, a family and your own life and stuff. We don't we don't know. But the idea that the uh, Mayi Theater is becoming a television studio, as we speak. <laughs> the idea that. Uh, you know, you say, you know, we reach out to disabled communities, now they can come to us, but maybe we do something with artists in, uh, in Korea. You know, we had people here from Taiwan, the Taiwanese government has given big grants to support artists very generously in one of their um, uh, missions was, you know, create something new, try to find something, you know, perhaps I can connect you with them, with also that big fund. Uh, they put 150 millions within the first four weeks towards next to existing grants. What you are facing here is also a, um, a scandalous American a reality that the arts are not supported, that there is no ministry of culture. We had our colleagues from Brazil who said it's devastating at the moment. It's really, really also as about food. Um, artists are being thrown into jail, uh, artists uh, for the wrong Instagram, for the wrong thing. And that the first thing this new president was Arano did was to close down the Ministry of Culture. It doesn't even exist here. And it's heartbreaking to hear that also New York City, in a way, I mean, Kushner once did say that it's the melting pot that never melted, you know, that New York City is not so proactive in that way as it perhaps could or should be to support you and your work. And um, we do have a commissioner of the arts and, um, and, but still, you know, and that you say I'm on my own, but maybe we, we cannot wait. Many theaters wait. Think about of the big Broadway theaters. I think, I don't hear of them making masks. I don't hear of them um, supporting social justice. Um, it's a, of course a commercial enterprise, it provides a lot of jobs and I'm also heartbroken for all of them, for the musicians, the technicians, the actors, mm -hmm. the ushers, everybody. It's a, you know, what makes New York, New York, but, uh, it's inspiring to hear that you uh, connect to an early artistic, you know, um, impulse. Um, what you had? When? How did you start theater? When? When did you say I want to do that? Uh, tell us a bit about that time in the Philippines. Oh, um, in high school, I, I uh, went against my parents' wishes and I enrolled in a theater workshop because <laughs> I really wanted to do it. Uh, you just had the idea or did you see something or what no, called you? I really wanted to do it. I really wanted to do it, but I couldn't, you know, I wasn't allowed. So it was not a, it was not a thing that, you know, I needed to be either a, a, a doctor, a lawyer or a priest. Those were my choices. And, and I didn't, I wasn't interested in any of them. So I went to the theater workshop and uh, I did it. And the first, and as, a, as an actor, but the first time I stepped on stage and saw that I could make an audience laugh or react was like an epiphany for me. It's a drug, right? And I never wanted not to take it again. And so I found a way. And even in college, I wasn't allowed to take theater arts. There was no way my parents would pay for that. Uh, for that course. So I had to take economics and finance and then finish that before I could take theater. Uh, but it took a long time. And I knew then that I, I really wanted to do it because I could see that, um, that I, I could do things on stage as an actor that I could never do in real life. It's one of those things. 
but eventually that grew because very quickly as I got out of high school, or I think even the last year, year of high school, I got connected to um, the, the, the protest movement. And it, all throughout college, I think I, I got deeper and deeper into that. And so I, I, I did, I no longer looked as theater as personal therapy for myself or empowerment. It, I began to see it as a, a tool for change and a, a social uh, mechanism for change. And that changed my perception of theater and what it can do. And then I came here and theater is vastly, vastly different. How did you get to New York? Oh, I started out, I went to California first. I had to, I stayed there for five years for school and then came to New York for school. In a theater school you stayed? Yeah, or? yeah. Mm -hmm. And then came to New York uh, with a bunch of my friends um, to study theater some more. Uh, but then I, that was also within one year we had founded my theater company. And that sort of, again, changed my trajectory. Like, okay, I'm not interested. I'm less interested in acting. I want to see what we can do with this. And, and then in uh, 1996, the artistic director left and I agreed to take on 1995, the director, artistic director left and I agreed to be artistic director temporarily for a few months until they could find a new artistic director. And here it is 25 years later and I'm still doing it. But, but that, that's how I sort of got into this theater thing. It was, it was an escape for me in the beginning, but very quickly became something else. And in New York, when I came, or at least in the United States, I mean, I couldn't get cast in anything with this space. I mean, I was, Nobody used Asian actors in 1980. So you had no chance in the audition? No, no I, no. I mean, I, I had to force myself. I was a spear carrier in, in Shakespeare plays. In, one, in, in the Scottish play, I was the bloody soldier. So they covered me in blood so that they wouldn't say, they wouldn't know that I was Asian. Um, there were those things. <laughs> there were those things and I accepted that. Um, my California is its own animal. And I came to New York and thinking, you know, oh, it's a little easier. It's not. And that's sort of also the reason we founded My Yi was because there were no opportunities for us. And we just, you know, I, it's also from the, my experience in the Philippines that I do not wait for anyone to solve my own problems. And this ethos that I, no one owes me anything that I have to make it happen. Um, and so that's how that happened. And uh, every year it, it's creeping forward a little bit. Um, in, when was this, maybe 20, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, our board emba embarked on a uh, capital campaign that established a reserve, uh, a capital reserve for the company that's still intact. That reserve, pays for staff salaries. So no matter what happens, we're going to pay our staff. How big is your staff? My, right now we have five mm -hmm. people, six now. We hired another person, six. Um, yeah, it's not big. Um, and Still, all, it's a lot, yeah. <laughs> we, have to, we have to keep everybody going and create the play. So yeah, we're lean. And in some ways, that, that is why, why we've survived. If we had taken on real estate, right, and a big staff, we would have been dead years ago. We would have been in debt, for sure. But we remain nimble, I think, and that's part of why we lasted. Um, and I don't see any reason to change mm -hmm. uh, in the near future, especially now. I think leanness is your, your friend. Um, Large institutions, like you said, like the Met Opera are struggling um, because those payrolls are huge. And yeah. without revenue coming in, I don't know how, to, how they're gonna keep that up. Um, 
So that is true for every large institution. As you know, um, OSF, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, furloughed 80% of its staff. Um, mm. That is huge. And I know that um, even the public had to do that some, but I think they've rehired all of them back. Um, but a lot of people are out of work. And, and uh, I don't know how we're going to put, how it's all going to fall into place. Mm -hmm. Uh, without intervention from mm -hmm. uh, our government. I have to say, though, that the city, the Department of Cultural Affairs, Affairs has been sort of helpful over the years. That's but they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're also, their hands are tied behind their backs because the money this year and next uh, will be severely cut. Uh, the city is looking at a $9 billion deficit this fiscal year mm -hmm. and that means cutting services across the board from teachers to firemen to police to of course the arts will always be um the last priority and so we everyone has to plan on severely reduced help from mm -hmm. the city and the state um and who knows what the NEA will be doing? They have an emergency fund of seventy-five million dollars for CARES, you know, um, for all the arts, for painting, for all the arts. film, yes. uh, poetry, all the uh, uh, right, sculpture, right. Uh, yeah. theater, opera. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, also that of course you know th there is a lot of money for the arts in America. Some studies suggest there might even be more than in Europe, but it goes to very big institutions. Ninety to ninety-five percent, if I understand right, of the budget of New York City goes to the big players, to the Whitney's of the world. Um, I hear rumors the lighting technician, the head of the Metropolitan Opera, makes a million or a million and a half, completely out of uh, balance with what is needed. That smaller institutions still have a struggle. To, uh, to be supported that there is an inequality. And I don't think we should close the mat. On the contrary, I think opera is fantastic and it's great, but also have that and, and include, and maybe invite you guys to do an opera one day or you know, somewhere. It doesn't maybe have to be the big one or whatever, but co co open your space. And that's missing. Um, it's even hard, I'm sure if you would call any big institution, can I get a rehearsal space from you? Even though they get so much more money, they will say, no, pay us and pay a lot. I've done, I've been through that and uh, when we worked for the Create New York thing. So it's, it's complicated. And uh, I think uh, what you do is, uh, is inspiring just to think the fact that you say, yeah, it's okay, let's find out about VR. Who would have thought that the Maggi Theater Company will say, you know, this is something interesting, let's look into it. Yeah, and also, or two. yeah. It's incredible, it's but it is actually also. And, um, but it is inequality, something is really wrong. It has to change. And the question is, how do we do that? A question for you also personally, you said you changed uh, from this kind of thing, you know, having fun in the theater. But of course, there were deeper reasons to go in there too. You could also have had fun at parties or hiking, you know, but you went to theater and perhaps what your parents wanted you to do to be a doctor or a priest and a lawyer, that's what you are. You know, you help to heal the city. You give a spiritual help and the kind of create art that people create meaning and you're a lawyer, you are, advocating for social change. So you do actually all of that, just in a different way. But do you think it worked? You say, I went into to be part of social change. Is it really working? Is Do you feel art can do that, theater can do that? Um, it's a challenge here in the United States because that connection is is not made. You know, a theater here is commercial um, most of the times. Also because the government forced us to think like businesses, right? We had to be sustainable. We had to have capital plans. We had to have, that's how we're, mm -hmm. we're asked to run theaters. Um, so uh, tying our activity into social change, it's not an easy thing, but it is possible. And I think, the fa for example, the Foundry Theater has done that very, very successfully um, in New York. Well, Melanie, you also said, you have to have Ralph on there, you know, on the Seagull Talk. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you also for her. Yeah, they, they did that in the most beautiful way. That's Remember correct. the Pins and Needle musical, you know, mm -hmm. the Sichuan, mm -hmm. like, though many other, the bus mm -hmm. tours, things right. are possible. It's true, but still, uh, 
the, uh, Trump gets elected. We have that situation now. What maybe we did things wrong? Uh, I like also that you said early on you had the burlesque idea. It did work. You know, somehow the police weren't shooting at you. You connected. You were on the streets. You did something for the people. This were seems all simple, but there's something in there um, that 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 um, that works. So you think? Um, do you think in 10, 20 years it will be different in New York, or will once we are over this, lose it? Everybody will be just go back to how it was. The great presence of the commercial theater, which I think four or five billion dollars. I don't know what the really is, I think six billion, I think, uh, I think The Lion King made eight or $10 billion in revenue. The Disney company in the history has never made more, as much money or Universal with, uh, um, uh, with their um, um, Broadway shows. And it's not distributed. It's not even great restaurant chefs says we have the $300 meals, but we need to have the great bistro restaurant for affordable prices. It's a sport and they do that, but it is not really yet there. And as you say, the Asian American community is a large one. It's a big one, an interested one, and it makes such a big contribution, but languages are not represented. Stories are not represented. Um, the Gorky Theater from Berlin, which we had as visitors, every play they show has Turkish subtitles. They don't think it has to be in German. And I never thought about this. They said, yeah, why should we? So here it would be, why is everything in English? You know, where, why shouldn't there subtitle on, every, on our small theaters, but also on the big ones? Why don't we think that way, you know? So, but do you think that will change will take place? Um, in the near term, yes, but it will revert back to a money-driven enterprise. Um, I don't see the government stepping up its support for the arts. And without that, it'll be a private uh concern and in the private sector money rules and because broadway has been pr uh, proven to be a money maker it's going to try its best to go back to that model and it will win um once everybody feels safe enough but in the near term they might have to make concessions on prices uh, if in the near term, maybe if they can go, we can start again in a couple of years, the prices might adjust because, um, you know, I don't, I'm, who's going to pay $600 to see Hamilton? Uh, so in the near term change, but in the long term, no. But that has all, that, that tension has always existed between commercial theater and sort of meaningful community theater or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. you know the independent theater that that uh has always existed and will continue to exist um they, because we you know it can't just be frozen all the time or lion king all the time um what what makes new york great is that you have this panoply of theatrical experiences um and that's what we want to keep you know, mm -hmm. Broadway is important because it employs people at the highest level. I want my friends to make money like that. But then it, you also have this other range of um, theaters that make the city vibrant uh, and vital, mm -hmm. I think. That's why yeah. people like it, like to come here. It's not because of Broadway, but because it's, there's a whole community of artists creating. Mm -hmm. And we never would like to see a bookstore where we just have the 20 or 30 most sold books. No, we want a bookstore full of shelves and the small ones and they support, they connect. Yes, and often the bestsellers are great, great books. Often they are not. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, what comes up a lot in our talk to say, you know, we have to go back to small spaces. That's how we started, but it actually also worked. We are close to the actor. There's something in there that is closer to the nature of theater, of uh, sharing a moment uh, that actors age in the same time where you're there, you share and uh, you build. The heartbeats synchronize it. All, all these things we do know. And actually people are healthier if they go to theaters and live music does something to our bodies like walking in nature. Besides, of course, that we they all should be doing it. And, um, so I think um, um, perhaps the very big solutions are not the right ones, the best ones. It's like, you know, but of course we like a Dunkin' Donut or something, but it's not good food. 
you know, it's not good for our bodies. And I think work you do in small spaces, it's innovative, it's creative, it's close to, um, uh, to, to our eyes. And I think something uh, of significance uh, happens there. And I think why New York City is so great that we have those big and the small, but still a theater like you, with all that you have achieved, that you have to struggle so hard, you know, that luckily you have a good board, you put things together, it's good for them that they support you, but not everybody had that. And, um, and uh, we need to find new, new structures. And what this crisis shows, it shows the structures are not working. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, is, it is complicated. So for you, um, the three things you commissioned, tell us a little bit about how did, did you had an open call or did you, so we know that a bit what, what artists are reacting. So did you make an open call? Did you ask people you knew already? And what are the commissions about? What are you experimenting with? We have a writer's lab. So um, how many writers are in there? 34. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. And they uh, have to be Asian, not have to be, they are Asian they American. Community. They are Asian American, you have to be. Um, and they live in New York? They have to live in New York? They do because they have to uh, meet every other week. Um, although some of them have taken TV jobs and are very successful. So men, some of them have moved to the West Coast, um, but others replace them. There's a big demand to be part of that writer's group. And uh, I initially approached three writers that I already knew that, that um, had ideas that they had pitched to me before. And I thought, well, let's pick up where we left. And so... I commissioned one writer um, whose idea was to write the death play. And that's already in its final stages. We're about to go into rehearsals for that. Say the, the name other, again. It's qu called Quiet Love. That's the Quiet title. Love. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's a play about with deaf actors. Mm -hmm. And he's working, that's a co- uh, he wrote, co-wrote this with another deaf, uh, deaf playwright. So uh, that's the track that they're headed. And I'm very interested in it, again, because I want to reach. Uh, it's an opportunity to work with the disabled community. Now, we did it uh, a couple of seasons ago. We did Teenage Take at the Public, uh, which featured disabled actors. Um, but this is, I want to keep that thing going um, and reach out to that community. And there's, it's a big community, and we, we absolutely, they should be, part of our regular programming anyway. Um, the other is a, um, the other play is a, uh, we're calling it Sophocles in Staten Island. It's um, a family in Staten Island, Asian American family in Staten Island that is homeschooling their kids. And the, su and the subject that they're taking up now are, are is Sophocles. So, they're devising, they're working with two playwrights from our lab. They're devising uh, a 30 minute Sophocles <laughs> um, play um, using found objects that, in their homes. It's the father, mother, and the two kids and the grandma creating this entire play. And we have a cinematographer and a director and a dramaturg all working uh, remotely. So the, they're training the family to handle cameras. Um, so the family is a real, is a, is a family? Oh, it's real. Family? Yeah, it's a real family. So the they're actors or? The father is, mm -hmm. but no one else is. Mm -hmm. So in the last few weeks, they've been staging plays. And now we have a cinematographer who's going to teach them how to use cameras and sound equipment and all that. And then we record it. And, um, and then that's, that's one. The other is a puppet play um, that is a riff on the uh, Japanese no, um, but we're setting it uh, in a, a barn in Wisconsin. And it's about a Japanese American family that is experiencing displacement, um, cultural displacement in the middle of the city and uh, with, the, with a kid with, who's on the spectrum. And it's a puppet play, but it's going to be shot. Uh, we're, we're filming theater. So I don't know how that's all gonna work, but 
We're using the camera to capture how the theater puppetry is made. So hopefully what we're going to try to find is the, that there is, a, there is a way to intersect the two in interesting ways. So it's not, it's not, it's sort of one or the, it's, it's both simultaneously. That's the idea. I don't know how to do that yet. Um, yeah. But that's going to, that we're shooting that in September. And then I've started tapping all the other writers to come up with 30 minute format material, 30 to 40 minutes, which is, I think how people want to consume these things online. Um, it's very difficult to ask people to watch something for two hours on their screens. Uh, I think we'll start pushing our audiences to longer and longer format, but in the beginning, we want to make sure they're with us and watching, and then we can go down. And we're going to make a lot of mistakes. We're going to make a ton of mistakes. We don't, we've never done this before. And so I, I, we're going to try to improve ourselves. And when we're ready, then we'll, we'll go long form. Uh, and also these are resources we're going to share, not just with, we're going to share it with all the, our, our fellow companies. So if they want to use the studios, it'll be available. Individual artists, it'll be available. Um, so we're not just keeping it to ourselves. I think, I think uh, that's, that's sort of part of our civic duty to, to share um, resources now. Um, and also to find ways of working together, right? That we sometimes are never allowed to do because um, we're always trying to figure out how to survive. Uh, but this is an opportunity, I think, to reach out across, mm -hmm. across communities. Like, hey, let's work together. We have this. And what do you, you want to do? Fantastic, yeah. Um, we're going to have on Friday, Ashley uh, Tara, who created that, that the Matt Forrest, the Churchill plays, came out of Bard College, I think, Gideon Investor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he uh, commissioned it and she had faced, should I stop the rehearsals or not? And with a coding genius or whatever, they came up with some kind of a way to create something that uh, seems to be working. I think she also has the idea to share it, uh, to share that uh, technology and we will, in whatever way that will be. I cannot wait to hear from her. So, so um, she found something, you will find something or collaborate in that way. We had the Paper Moon Theater Company from uh, Indonesia, also a lot of oh, yeah. puppets. Uh, yeah, and she said, Ria, that uh, yeah, one of their innovations was they sent puppet building material to families. They built something, you know, and then they would work something with them. They have also no people in the community commission place. They pay $50 or whatever. And, yeah. they, and they will create uh, the writers or the puppet for them, just for them. They created things for nurses. So things are are moving. Yesterday, we had uh, Emmanuel from the Great Teatro de la Ville in Paris, who said, yeah, yeah. what we did is, uh, I said, I didn't want to talk to anyone. It's so devastating. I just to use the phone. I used my time. So the, most probably the most, the theater was the most resources in France and the most in Europe. And he said, we, what we did as a homeopathic pill, as a, he would use a work of healing and almost like a doctoral consultation they would people could call from paris the theater and um talk to an actor or a director and they would find a poem for them and read it for them make a recording encourage them so new forms um, um are popping up and he feels very strongly and i think um uh, good idea to build bridges with the art uh, scientific community and uh, with education uh, let countries collaborate work together he invited also new york to come out so i think in a way uh, it's a forced innovation but there is of course a government support that goes beyond i think the teatro de la ville mostly has more than three times as one theater what the nea will give out as an emergency fund so it's a um, um such a different um a different um, um, situation what we face here but I love to hear uh, that you really are so innovative that you are taking up that uh, challenge I, I haven't heard that in that way you know from companies we are still struggling we also slowly getting you know on those 10 weeks now uh, we are moving ahead but this is a significant uh, a development to hear from a New York company how it reacts how fast you do that and how that will be shared how, how many more viewers you might get for your work with the TV studios following a bit, maybe TV format minutes, but how many more viewers, maybe even from around the world, will see what you do and later on there might be a fusion. And as Rancière, the great philosopher said, uh, 
when a really old, old tech, uh, tradition like theater comes together with something new, something happens and he claimed the dances of Louise Fuller who herself hold 40 patents on lighting and lights and moving things which she invented and everybody thought and knew of this was something great at the time and uh, we people saw life in a different way and got at ease with the new times. Um, but my question also for you, we are coming closer, and how, how did you, as a person as well, um, you know, who went to high school and university and all of it and had started acting, had to struggle with the fact that it was impossible to be, in a way, part of the theater community. You had to create your own. You were forced to do it. You had no other chance. And luckily, you had the tools and the tenacity and audacity to do it. But how, how are you experiencing this time? How long have you been confined? What's going through your mind? How do you, how do you carry it also the responsibility and in your own life as a, how, what's going on? Well, I've, I've been confined here. For how long? Since March, since March 12th or March 15th, I think. I was at Long Wharf directing a play that just began tech um, on March 12. March 12 was our first day of tech. Um, and that, we never finished it because halfway through, um, it was decided that we couldn't move forward. So uh, we, all, we all were sent home. Um, uh, this is at Long Wharf. They paid everyone though, their entire mm -hmm. contract. Mm -hmm. um, but ever since then I've been home and I've stayed home pretty much uh, since then I, I don't venture out much uh, except to, if I have to buy something or walk around the block or something like that but I come back in what uh, it has done for me I'm actually busier now than when I'm not confined um, there's so much to do uh, right now talking to artists figuring out what the where to get money that's what I'm doing I'm chasing money all over the place uh, and I'm I'm driven um, I guess this confinement also knowing that um, the survival of the company depends on what on the decisions that we make in the near term is driving me to make sure that we've got things in place um, I'm I don't know about it, uh, but very early on, I went to the worst case scenario. Like what happens uh, if we're not able to do this and, and if we're not able to make theater for X number of years, what happens? We need to be prepared for that. And then hope that it doesn't last that long, but have a plan in place. Um, so we're not caught flat footed. Um, there's also chasing new alliances, I think with other theater companies and um, talking to the artists about what they're feeling, how they're feeling, what are they thinking about, what impulses do they have, how do we want to, how, how can we make art together, or what are you, what are you thinking about, how can I support it, um, and then getting money out to the artists as quickly as possible. Mm. As soon as we get money, it's out. Um, we're not hanging on to it. Um, but then figuring out how to keep that thing going. And, and so that's what I've been doing here inside this, my apartment is finding money, talking to artists, looking for solutions and coming up with plan after plan after plan. What if this happens, if that happens, if that happens, if that happens, um, what That's, street is it in New York where you are? What's your forty seven? I'm on forty. I'm in Hell's Kitchen. I'm on forty seven and nine. In Hell's Kitchen, the old yeah. actor studio's neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, how do you keep your batteries running? How do you recharge? What do you do? How, um, do you read? Do you listen to music? Uh, what how, do you talk to? And so how do you do it? I've been writing uh, my thoughts down on how to. Every day you write. I do every day. I write. I don't watch TV. Uh, it's completely unnecessary to me right now. Um, I read. Um, I'm a news junkie. So I I read that now. But I, I'm also not consuming as much news as I used to because it's all about Trump. And I don't really 
care. Mm. Um, so it's reading. Sometimes I'll listen to music, but it's mostly writing and thinking. I think a lot now, <laughs> like coming up with strategies. What am I going to do? Who's going to, who am I going to go to? Can that person give me money? All that. That's mm. all I think about every single day. And, uh, so what do you read and what music do you listen to? Music is usually jazz and classical. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction and um, autobiographies. Recently, though, I've been starting to read about New York history. I mean, I've, I've had a collection of books about New York history, um, architecture, art, all that stuff. Um, and it feels like I want to locate myself in the timeline of New York. Like this, where am I? You know, when, when this happened, because I remember doing that in 9-11. And even before, I've always been a junkie about New York history. But 9-11 was an opportunity to like, oh, where are we? Um, and where does this fit? And now here's another thing, a moment like that. Like, um, it, it's comforting to know that New York, New York is resilient. Yeah. Um, and that there's a long, long, long line of um, adverse events that people have had to deal with and that it's somehow managed to sort of survive. That's comforting to me, knowing that there's that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is my moment. This is where we are and what are we gonna do uh, and see how that all sort of fits in. It's part of, it's part of everybody trying to figure out how to live yeah. in this time. And, yeah. and that's how I, I go back to those history books. I don't know why it's, but mm -hmm. that's where I find solace nowadays um, is reading like historical stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as someone I think I've said it before suggested also we need to learn about history. So we learn that we don't learn from it, you know? So, uh, and to be reminded um, of it, but it's, so it's a great, great, great city and it will go through this. And, will reinvent itself. We're in the middle of a new chapter. It's as dangerous as the big financial crisis in the 70s. Yeah. You know, as the draft riots, uh, as uh, the, the, the complications and the depression, depression, some people claim it's even more significant, uh, mm. unprecedented. Uh, uh, and we haven't felt the full the, brunt of it. You know, this yeah. is the beginning. The first curfew in 100 years in New York City. There has not been one, if that's a, or 70 yeah. years, the times. I mean, so... Uh, let's be in this moment, but let's all be part of a change. As a closing statement, you know, what do you say, I, I guess, to your 30 writers when they sit in their circle, I guess, or whatever you, and it's fantastic that you give a home to them and that you listen to their stories. You're saying they're important, that you work so hard that they can be shown because they are our stories. They're everybody's story. How incredibly different they are. And that makes them so the same because they are different. So, but what do you say to these artists in this time now? What should artists be doing? And what do, should we all be thinking about? What is your advice? What do you think is of importance? I think it calls for, this moment calls for generosity from everybody, including all the writers, including all the artists. What can you give to the world, to your community outside? It's about sharing what you have, um, being generous with your collaborators, reaching out across divides. Uh, that's what we, that's the advice. Uh, and somehow find the creative impulses in those kinds of, of attempts, right? Um, but that, it, that's what it calls for. You have to be generous. Um, it can't be about me, 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 or I, 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 or whatever. It's just not, that's not going to work. And and I hope that all the artists sort of think about that. It's very difficult, you know, when you have nothing, um, when you're struggling and you have no money to be generous, but there's ways to find that. And I think that's sort of how we get through this, um, that there is that moment of redemption at the end of this, but you have to be, you have to be giving as difficult as that is, that's the challenge is how to be generous now uh, for all artists. Because we're, we're, you know, we've always lived in a culture of scarcity, but 
every time we make something, it's it's an act of generosity, especially for nonprofit artists who, who make nothing. And now I think is a time to redouble those efforts even more. I don't, uh, it's a lot to ask, but that's what the moment asks of artists right now. And in a way, I think it makes our community so special. It is a community that is uh, really a giving community. It's compassionate and really, really generous. What artists do in their lives, the contribution they make to society, what the material representation get for it from that society. And it's truly uh, uh, also a community that makes me proud to be part of and uh, be part of, and you're part of it. So we look up to you and your work. And it is very, very good advice to be uh, passionate, to be present, to collaborate and uh, to, to do things. I think you gave us a real insight, you know, in, in, for, in this moment and this day and in this time and your, how you experience this. And of course we could, and have talked to many artists and companies, but this was a very special uh, um, uh, session, I thought, where we really hopefully understand a bit more and also see the importance of your work. And I'm impressed, you know, by the initiatives. I haven't heard that so far. And I think you really uh, are uh, uh, taking, as you always have done, action and create something and you don't wait uh, for um, approval of things you do, you do something, and as, as you know, it's the only way. Otherwise, it has never would have never been created, which is sad. And I think it's wrong that this way of working is held up as a model by that liberal capitalism. Look at the artists; they fail, no one supports them. But one day, they become more successful. You should be like this: be your own uh, little company, be self-employed, and maybe one day you make it. It's not true. This is not how it works. The structure now exposes it that this is wrong. There needs to be a sustainable uh, support for health insurance, for access to education, for access to the arts. That's what why governmental uh, ideas are important. And we now see around the world what works and what doesn't. And it doesn't look good in, in America. We have to take that serious. So really, really, really um, um, thank you. And um, sure. I want to just, you know, um, let you guys know who's coming up again. Yesterday, we had this interesting talk with Emmanuel de Marcimotta from Paris and what his theater as a public theater, Théâtre de la Ville, what they come up with was most impressive uh, as, a, as a strategy, uh, how they do it. And uh, tomorrow we hear from Israel, three writers who will share with us the real complexity um, of that country. No, most of it should be 10 writers from Israel, but three will be there. Ruth Kenner, Joshua Sobol, and Maya Arad Yassour will tell us um, about uh, how they experience the COVID moment, but also what is changing and how they see it. Afra um, Siridopoulou uh, will talk us from Greece and from Cyprus and uh, give us an update. And Ashley Tada, which I have mentioned earlier, will share with us uh, her experience from the Met Forest, that Churchill play that somehow found something, the work with these students, what she did. And um, so the software she created, I think there is something in there. It's a, uh, it's, I think it is a work of art she created, and it's something in between a theater of him. Uh, and uh, so we'd like to hear hear more. And yes, uh, Nigel Smith, uh, James Shrugs, Tamila Woodward, uh, uh, the great Woody King um, will join us and others, you know, to focus also for this moment uh, what the Black community is experiencing. It's so horrible and uh, devastating and uh, what these images do to us. Images that also haunt us and uh, that theater have to create images of imagination that go beyond the image that we remember and perhaps do not even meditate on what's behind how big that really is and uh, that relentless thing and what it produced so and the great uh, Jean-Luc Nancy one of the great philosophers on this will, will talk to us and uh, give us why do we need art and I think it will be an interesting conversation uh, honor to host that. So um, please do stay connected, uh, join with us. And Ralph, again, a congratulation. Makes me proud to be in New York and to have company like yours. And uh, But you really, really deserve help. You should get help as the, all the other communities. Um, it, the majority of New York City is no longer white. I also want to point that out. It is not reflected on the stages. It is not reflected in the institutions. I think there was a study before Tom Finkelpearl took over the uh, commission as commissioner of the arts. He did a study. It was the worst offender. Every fire department, the police department, help community, everybody did well. The arts were the worst. How can that be? It's shocking. 
And uh, so your contribution has been an important one. You are a pioneer. But as they say, pioneers are the one who gets the arrows in the back. So, uh, but I really uh, admire you that you went on. And as you said, companies like the Foundry and so many others, Melanie, um, and I'm doing a work that uh, contributed to the change and perhaps this will be people really will listen more than before. So thank you all for joining to the audience. Thanks for taking our time. We're getting our talks a little bit longer than we used to be. Uh, I hope you will forgive us, but these are complex stories and the situation we are in is complex and perhaps it needs a bit more time, but listening is important. It's something also we can do and it's important to have a great audience. Ultimately, it's all but you, the listeners, how does it work in your life? Will we all be able to change? Emmanuel talked about this. We have to do ourselves authentic change. We have to also work on ourselves. This is important. So this is fantastic of you guys to, to listen in and many, many other talks that are going on. We're just a small, tiny part. We are very, very small center. Um, and, um, but it is of um, significance that we connect to the global world. Um, out there and to howl around to support us every day. I know it's a big deal for them and uh, not an easy thing to do. Uh, so Thea, VJ, Travis, thank you. Thank you for supporting howl around early on. I hear that you were, when they created, you were on their site and said that is supporting, that is an important thing. And of course the Siegel team, um, uh, Andy and San Yang. And uh, thank you all for listening, for tuning in, stay safe and stay tuned. And I hope you will, um, Join us tomorrow for an update from Israel. Bye-bye. Thank Ralph you. Again. Thank you.